The first thing we're going to do is talk about this uh, guest a lecture we had about human wildlife conflict. Great lecture. I would say her name, but I, I um, butcher it. Just what was interesting about that. And then I will go and select to primate species. That's not holiday. So um, old world monkeys. And I'll select one of those species and I'm going to go up to over that. And then next, we're going to go over sound pollution, um, noise pollution in the ocean. I'm going to give you a heads up right now. I'm not really good with scientific names. So when we get to the um, noise pollution site, I'll break it down into categories of what species grade well and everything like that. So first, let's talk about human conflict. Human conflict was anything where human wildlife conflicts is anytime wildlife and humans conflict. What I found most interesting about this whole lecture was, first of all, the amount of people that die from snakes a year. Uh, we see about five people a year, maybe, in America. And just that was amazing to me. And how many people actually get attacked by elephants and salads a year. The crop loss, what the government could consider as com compensation was quite amusing. Um, baffling amounts of debts. The leopards being in the urban um, city of Mumbai, just walking around eating street dogs was amazing. But I think the most interesting thing I can say about this whole presentation was the fact that the Indian people believed that these, these animals were there for a reason, that they're urban cats. The animals have just as rights to this land as us. They learn to live with them cohabitate, there will be threats, but they respect these species. And I think these are things people around the world and it should have the same mindset as them. So that was what I really respect y'all. The next thing, like I said, in the part two was expecting, um, selecting a species. I chose the mandrel, Mandrilla sphinx. All right, so the habitat and range of the uh, mandrel is in the central and west, uh, west coast central of Africa. Um, they can go over tropical rainforest to savannas and freshwater swamp areas. So I highlighted exactly where they are in the IC, um, ICU and red list. So we went over there. And the next thing we're gonna do is go into the diet. So mandrels are opportunistic. They're omnivores, but they, um, they're omnivores, but they eat hundred different plants and seeds. And the insects, the insects, eggs, birds, tortoises, rats, even pork and pines. So anything they can really catch, you're gonna to try to eat. Um, but they mainly eat fruit, seeds, and different plants because it's, it's optimum foraging. It's not a lot of work to eat those things. So I made the title, they are one big monkey. Um, they are the largest of all, or, 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 largest and heaviest of the old world monkeys. They, um, they're sexually dimorphic and sexually dichromatism. So the chromatids cause different coloring on their face and stuff like that. And the dimorphism, they, um, they're bigger than the females. So to get into that a little bit more, males have a brighter and flamboyant colors than the females and males are larger than the females. So that's their dimorphism and dichromatism. So their characteristics, males weigh about 42 to 82 pounds some of them have been measured to 119 pounds, which is ridiculously um, heavy. Females, half that size, 22 to 33 pounds, and they generally um, stay in about that 22 to 33 level with the median. Um, we'll get back to this, but just look at the color difference in the females and the size difference of the head. That's what I was getting at. So that's a full grown female, this full grown male, just even the nose. And remember, these are old world monkeys, so their nose goes down versus up. And so, that just shows you the size difference of their hair and their head, I'm sorry. Um, reproduction and parenting, their alloparenting. Um, child care is provided by individuals other than the parents all the time. So they exist among all mand mandrels. So the female provides child care to, and it might be a female relative and not the actual biological mother. It's kind of like that kin, that rule of kin we went over in the um, previous lectures. Sometimes it's better for nine cousins to survive the own kid. So that's how we would do that. So gestation, 179 to eight, 182 days. Number of young, usually one to two. Which you think that's low, but we'll go and see why it really is not that big of a deal. So behavior and lifestyle, mostly terrestrial. They are uh, digigrade quadpedalism. So they walk on all four limbs, um, walking on the toes. So they're not knuckle walking um, like uh, gorillas do. 
Mandrels live in multi-male and multi-female groups, but they average about 40 members, always with a dominant male. But sometimes they have large troops of 600 to 800 individuals, and those things are massive. There's a video I wish I could add in here of a plane flying over and just hundreds of them running at one time. It's always headed by a dominant male who in, in, in this harem society mates with multiple fertile females and fathers and virtually fathers all the infants in the group. Males are solitary after they do meet, mate, they like to stay on the outside, but they will always come back to protect the, um, the group or the troop if it's bigger than the um, 40 or 50 members. So attributes, this is their hand. Um, they cleaned it off a little bit. So that just shows you their thumbs. They're good at climbing. Um, they prefer to stay on the ground because of how they, um, how heavy they are but they can climb if need be they're not really good swimmers they run all fours at surprising speed um their top their back legs are a little shorter than their um, front legs they got short stumpy tails they can live 20 years in the wild about 46 in captivity um let's focus on what we really know about them they are their teeth in color their canines can go up to 2.5 inches now they have a bright red stripe and framed by the ridge of uh, blue fangs. So it blazes between the mandrels, uh, close set eyes down the middle of elongated muzzles, circling the nose area. So this red stripe goes down here between the two, um, the two blue spots. They got a naked rump, um, even added more splashy color, painting it bright hues of red, purple, blue and purple, and I'll show you that picture. And the man mandrels genitals, are also colored red. And when they become excited, the coloring of their um, buttocks frighten, uh, brightens. And when males, females, like old monkeys, and when they're ready to mate, their genitals, they're very, they, they protrude and they get very um, red and very bright. And that's just so when she's an estrus and then she's ready to mate. So they're not lying. So right here, you know, we got red, blue, and purple right here, and that will, um, change different colors when need be. Um, if they're excited or if the females are ready to mate, if he's about to fight, these will these will change different colors, which is an amazing feat in, in, in um, how they can do it. Um, uh, sorry, it's just amazing feat on how their body has uh, evolution has allowed that to happen. And this is that red stripe down the nose, um, followed by the two flamboyant blue areas on their um, closely set, very closely set eyes. And again, remember they're old monkeys, so they have a long nostril facing down versus the gorillas and chimpanzees, for example. So, next, last thing we're gonna cover is noise pollution. And it's the silent killer, as in we don't hear it, but they do. Um, and I say killer because before we start this, um, this part, we did watch a video on YouTube, a group of beach whales showed up and they couldn't figure out why these whales just were on this beach. And it turns out there was a whole bunch of sonar practice going on the day before with a lot of ships. And it turns out the sonar pinging confused the whale sonar ability to see everything. And they ended up on the shore as beach whales killing uh, multiple uh, whales. So what is this study? So the number of watercraft is in the rise from private boats to commercial shipping across the oceans. So. Coverage of the species, habitat, vessel types, and type of investigator are all in this, um, in this study. The method is we have to collect a study of articles and contain the certain criteria. So it's a collective study, meaning this wasn't really an experiment of their own. This is them collecting data from tons of other articles to see if they can get um, form a, uh, a hypothesis in. In conclusion, so they have to have dealt with marine vessels. All articles had to dealt with mammals. Um, they had to measure, observe, modeled, and estimated response of sound. But they didn't have to. They did not. They did not need to have measured or modeled sources, levels of recorded surface levels of noises. So per se, you know, when we get to the pinnipeds or the um, sirens or the mandatees, they didn't know the noise level, but they just knew that when the boats become the noise would do a certain effect to the animals. So they got 154 articles, 47 marine species dating back and it, the cutoff time is 2000. I'll show you this to show you, this is a couple of, uh, this is how many articles are collected, publications, but there are certain species that got the most and a lot of species that did not out of the 47. So this is very important later in the study. I just wanted to give you a little detailed view of it. So 
these, the first effects we focused on were your pygmy whales, gray whales, blue whales, and your bowhead whales, your filter feeders. Um, this is what we really went after here. And so the, out of the studies that got, your humpback whales were most studied. And so the United States is high noise exposure with tourism vessels. And with this, when they, the humpback whales would talk, they would, they would um, increase their decibels from zero to eight to one decibel um, to ambient noises and vocalize less, less frequently. So they would vocalize louder, but they would do it less frequently. Uh, humpback whales did not respond to sonar vessels when sonar was total off, so that's good. So it was just a lot of noise from the engine and mostly the propeller. That makes the most amount of noise is the propeller. So a North American right whales, um, which you see right here, this is how they would look, show no behavioral response to noise at all, or at least best, uh, decibels between 132 and 142. So they just tended to act and there was no behavioral change. So I show you this, this is, so we're on the, you know, the, the filter feeder whales. So they're the, the blue um, blue rectangle. So it shows you their habitat and range is where these were all studied for your Pacific, your Arctic, and your oceans right here, um, Atlantic. So and in um, little in your Indian, and that's how that went. So, however, a lack of behavioral change in the right whales is particularly concerning due to the high levels of strip strike of strip strike in these species affecting their conservation. Debt. So the fact that they're not affected. Is concerning because they're still getting hit by the ships. So we do not like that. Um, we rather them go away. But they're vocally adapted to the environments, but increase low frequency noises through shift in vocalization, frequency, and duration. So they will switch their vocal, um, they will twist their vocal levels based on how many um, ships are there. But there is always a loss of communication range to commercial ships. So next is your beach whales. Um, so we're gonna go talk about them, your beach whales, this is your dolphins, your killer whales, your orcas. And so that's how we're gonna go, not beach whales, but tooth whales. So these are your tooth whales and you know, this is your belugas and narwhals, everything like that. Your orcas won't get their porpoises. So focal species of where in a lot of the studies were beluga whales. And so we went to, with that, they focused with a lot of icebreakers and they would, um, whales lost, whale pods, and this shouldn't be in there, but basically they would change their behavior um, between the 94 and 105 decibels. So when I say change of behavior, any pollution, any pollution is anything that causes natural behavior to take place. So if they would go this way, and this is what they would do every day, noise pollution would stop that. They would go this way now, that is the altering behavior. So again, these are your tooth whales. This is gonna go, um, this studies your Pacific, your Atlantic, your Arctic, a lot of your Arctic right here, you know, in Southern Oceans and it, it, so this is where we're at with that. Um, that just shows you habitat and range. But the biggest thing was narwhals. So narwhals change their locomotion and in, in direct and slower movement would sink to levels. They would sink to levels at uh, 124 decibels. So the louder the thing, they would actually stop moving and just go down. They didn't want to deal with it and they didn't like it. So they would, um, anything that was at 124 decibels, which is not that hard for a ship to make, um, they went down. Sperm whales, fewer clicks, killer whales in surface time. Killer whales would change their behavior. Again, their hunting or anything or how where they would swim, surface time, anything when I say behavior, they would change at 98 decibels. Little known was about dolphins. And porpoises were shown changing their prey behavior. And this is very concerning because we can't stop noises. And if they're not eating what they eat, need to eat, they have any nutritional um, problems in conservation status. So the next, we're going to focus on your manatees, Serenia. Um, so dugongs, these are not whales, of course, but this is focused on in noises. So when dugongs would hear it, they would be less likely to go near the boats, changing forage and behavior. And manatee would hear it, they detect it, changing their orientation, depth, and diving behaviors. But this, again, could be it's noise pollution because they hear it and the noise is actually changing the design, desired way and effect behavior of these, these um, species. But then again, there's a lot of ship on manatee conflicts. And so it's the fear of these um, ships hitting them too. So your seals, seals were also studying on this, um, which is really cool. 
the underwater noise, the watercraft, potentially mask or alter communication with pinnipeds. Potentially, they really didn't have a lot of data, but they need to further explore this effect. And so again, the pinnipeds, so this is where your manatees and, um, were studied and your pinnipeds or the green triangles. So that focuses a lot of Japan, Australia, um, the coast of America and sides and Europe. So here's some issues with this study. Um, a few studies employed acoustic recording tags. So there was a lot of noise. There wasn't a lot of tagging of animals that recorded um, noise. Studies determined received levels. They did so by modeling or estimation. They would just get a group and then they'd have to estimate using some type of statistical system that gets away to, sorry, to understand what the levels are. And the measuring ship noise is complicated with no standard of what tool to use. We haven't got there yet. So one microphone, and if you don't know much about microphones, and I wish I had mine, there's condenser mics, there are all these different mics, and each one can record different frequencies. So you have to understand which one you're going to use for a set, set thing, set recording device. This is a fusion study design where you float and the GPS goes down, you wait the recorder, and it um, will get um, sounds from there. And that's how they're thinking about doing it. So it's good. Um, that actually, this is important because that's what they're using in the video for the 10 minute video. He's doing that. Something that sits on top, goes down to all these different levels, and it can even anchor on the floor, and they can hear how the um, sound affects everything. Species coverage 47 species were impacted, are studied, but again, most of them were certain species. So we have a lot of empty space right here where we don't have a lot of data. We have the humpback whales and some of the other whales, right whales. But again, we don't have a lot of data so that we need to get more attention in more than just one, one publication. Geographic range, we need to understand a lot of it wasn't done in the Arctic. So annual migrating of the um, filter whales, the humpback and everything depend on the Antarctic um, Ocean for its summers, for feeding. And as they do not feed while they're tropical breeding grounds and, and so what we need to do is we need to spread it out more, figure out geographic range, really place the devices there to see how it affects both during the Arctic, post, uh, during and after breeding. And since ship noise is rapidly increasing off of Antarctica, we need to really focus on that. Um, and the last, well, there's two more, but jet skis and water skis, and none of them have paid a little attention, but the biggest thing is what type of ships do we need to focus on? And I just wanted to put this on here to give you an idea. There's so many different ships. There's a trawler, the hovercraft, the battleship, the destroyer. And I really use these just to show you, these are medium-sized ships compared to your cargo ships, and they make a lot of noise. Your cruise ship and your barge, all these things make a lot of noise. And so it's, what do you focus on? Do we focus on that? You don't have enough money and time to focus on every species. So what you do focus on is what exactly are you gonna study at this point? So type of impacts. So we need to come up with a logical challenge. Consequently, many studies have focused on the former easy identify response. So when they say that they're saying, okay, we hear noises in the, the um, whale turn away. We haven't studied cortisol levels. We haven't studied reproduction rates and the easy thing like that. And so that's what we need further on for noise pollution. But the good thing is, like the video says, noise pollution is quite quick. And once the noise is made, it doesn't last like fuel, plastic, or anything like that. So that is the final exam. I hope you um, answer all your questions. And it was a great semester. I love this style of uh, making a PowerPoint. I know we can always do better on it. But um, thank you so much. Thanks.